and, and what a privilege, what an honor, and what a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to gather together, read, share all your work, and we are very excited for all the readers today. Uh, second, I would like to thank Ethica for letting us use this beautiful venue for free. Um, my name is Ardi Kasha. For those of you who don't know, I'm, I'm the newly appointed director of the Creative Writing Program. Yeah. My colleagues are here. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Um, we are very excited to have um, uh, our new student reading tonight. And I'm going to introduce the first reader. And uh, we'll, we'll have readings from David Duncan, uh, Abhijit Sharma, Maxine Mertaz, uh, Neoma Ujuko and Ellen Boyd. Um, my colleague uh, Andrew Zawaki will be introducing some of the readers as well. I'll go ahead and introduce um, David Duncan. Uh, David uh, grew up in rural East Alabama before attending the University of South in Zawani, Tennessee. He has a master's in literature from uh, University of Alabama and a master of fine arts from uh, Ohio State University. His recent fiction and nonfiction appear in Five Points, The Sun Magazine, and just today in the Oxford American. Um, Why do I have to go first? Oh, <laughs> so since I just had something come out in the Oxford American, I get to read from it, which is a cool experience. Um, this is uh, like a mix of memoir and investigative journalism which is also something I've never done before. Um, I'm really happy with how it came out. It was a really interesting experience to investigate a crime as part of a writing project and to mix in my personal experience with something like that. So I'll just read the first couple of sections. Oh, it's called Undetermined Circumstances. It was a late spring morning when I set out driving to the small, unnamed creek in southeast Alabama where Kyle Clink scales had been found. I wanted to decide for myself what seemed more likely, that he crashed his car and died, or, as most people in the area believed, had been killed and put there. The creek was in Chambers County, about a five-hour drive from my home near Nashville. Back in December of 2021, someone had spotted the hatchback of his 1974 Pinto roundabout sticking above the muddy water and reported it to the police. Later that day, after removing the car from the creek, police found human remains inside along with Kling Scales' ID. He'd been missing for 45 years. There hadn't been any updates since the discovery. <clears throat> my route to the creek was similar to the one I would have taken to visit my father, south on I-65, east on I-20, exit on the Highway 431 through the Talladega National Forest. My father still lives in the same place where I grew up, an unincorporated community in East Alabama called Delta. Now I'm 42, though, and I don't visit as often as I once did. After leaving the National Forest, I watched the passing scenery, once so familiar, with an outsider's gaze. A junkyard, a lonesome gas station, kudzu. I just moved back to Nashville after living three years in London, London, and wondered how these scenes would strike the friends I'd made there. Around noon, I pulled off the side of the road to take a picture of the Dixie General Store, which sells Confederate flags and MAGA memorabilia and so on, and sent it to a friend who shares my loathing of such things. I was in too much of a hurry to stop at the haunted chicken house with its display of stacked and overturned antique hearses, then came within 10 minutes of my father's house but kept heading south, then crossed the Tallapoosa River, the same river where my mother had crashed and died when I was 14. It was because of my mother's death that I was so drawn to the Klingscales case. She'd become a missing person back in 1994 and stayed missing for two years. During that time, I never once stopped believing she was alive and one, would one day return home or be found. But then, late summer of 1996, a scuba diver who was inspecting the supports at Foster Bridge came across her car. Some of her remains were inside. The rest had washed out into the Tallapoosa. South of Lafayette, the dirt roads and embankments become a garish red, heavy with oxidized iron. The sight of red dirt always makes me melancholy. I spent the first 15 years of my life in the Piedmont region of the state, and have always thought of it as a transition zone from the mountains to the coastal plains, a place people drive through without noticing much except poverty and red dirt. It was mid-afternoon when I passed Cusetta without realizing it. 
I met several logging trucks loaded with timber, then saw the sprawling cutover where the logs were coming from. Past the cutover, I crossed a small bridge over a muddy creek. A couple of miles later, when I reached Interstate 85, it hit me. That must have been the creek. I'd looked at it on Google Earth. I knew the creek was small, but this one hadn't seemed anywhere near big enough to conceal a car for 45 years. I turned around and headed back. The prospect of seeing the spot where a kid had vanished made me feel a little sick. It reminded me of the agony of not knowing where someone you love has gone and why they won't come back. <clears throat> one, one June afternoon in 1994, my mother told my father and me she was going to the Piggly Wiggly about six miles away in Lineville. I had just turned 14. When the store closed at 9 o'clock that night, she still hadn't returned. When the, uh, around an hour later, my father and I went looking for her. When we returned home, we called the hospital, then the police, then every other person we could think of. A county investigator visited early the next morning to tell us that my mother had been scheduled the day before to come in for an interview about some money that had disappeared from a neighbor's trailer. My father had no idea about this. The investigator told us he believed my mother was now hiding to avoid prosecution for this theft. During the next two years, I believed all kinds of stories about my mother, stories that served to explain how the mother I thought I knew could leave me and stay hidden without even, even letting me know she was okay. I believed the police when they said that she would eventually get tired of hiding and come home, that she was probably staying in California with some distant relatives, that one day somebody would spot her and pick up the phone, or a police officer would pull her over and run her tag, or someone would crack and tell us where she was. Then, when she was found dead, I didn't know what to believe. Mostly, I just went numb. Fast forward 24 years. I was doing my best to homeschool my two daughters through the first London lockdown and sneaking lots of quick YouTube breaks to decompress when a video about scuba divers finding a car pop popped up in my suggestion list. I clicked it. The algorithms took notice. Over the next few months, I watched dozens of similar videos about scuba divers finding people who'd been missing for years, sometimes decades. Apparently, Using scuba gear and high-end sonar technology to search for missing people underwater had become a hobby of sorts, and some of its devotees had their own YouTube channels. I'd never known that so many cars were scattered throughout America's waterways, the creeks, rivers, reservoirs, even retention ponds, with so many unmourned bodies inside them. I found it a little comforting to learn that what had happened to my family wasn't as rare as I'd always thought. By the summer of 2021, when I moved back to the Nashville area, I'd grown bored watching these videos, but some of them still appeared in my suggestions. In December, when the video about Kyle Zinskills appeared, I only clicked it because he was from LaGrange, Georgia, where my father and I had often gone fishing at West Point Lake, and because the creek where he'd been found was only an hour south of Foster Bridge where my mother had died. Kyle Klingskills had last been seen on January 27, 1976, at the Moose Club in LaGrange, Georgia, where he worked part-time as a bartender when he wasn't attending classes at Auburn University. When his shift ended at 11 p.m., he left, supposedly heading back to his apartment in Auburn, about 40 miles away. His parents were expecting to see him again on Friday, but they didn't think too much of it when he didn't arrive. They figured he'd gotten tickets to a basketball game in Gainesville he'd mentioned wanting to watch. But by Tuesday, they'd grown worried enough to notify the police. 45 years, 10 months, and 12 days after he left the Moose Club, Kyle Klingscale's remains were found. Maybe the water level in the creek had lowered over the years, or maybe the metal latch on the hatchback had rusted away and finally gave way, allowing the hatchback to pop open and rise above the water. The people who needed to know most that Kyle had been found, his parents, were both dead. His father, John, had died of a heart attack in 2007. His mother, Louise, had died in January of 2021, less than one year before her son was finally found. After watching a couple of news stories about the case and reading every article I could find online, I dialed up my father. It's just a little creek, I said. I don't even think it has a name. Oh, well, he said. 45 years, can you imagine? I don't guess. My father has a few short stock responses he rotates through when people talk to him. The phrases themselves mean little. It's his tone that conveys his meaning. That day on the phone, his tone told me he was as intrigued by the case as I was. They both died without knowing, I said. It was this detail that had most drawn me to the story. All righty then, he said. 
We talked about it a while longer and then hung up without mentioning my mother once. I rarely mentioned my mother to him. It made me uncomfortable to say mommy, which is what I'd still called her when she disappeared. And to say my mother felt like I was telling a stranger about her. So I just told him about Kyle Klink's skills, confident he knew what I wanted to convey, that as bad as it had been for us, it could have been so much worse. I don't think that was 10 minutes, but uh, that's pretty much where I decided to Abhijit Sharma is a poet and researcher of global indigenous writing, with particular focus on Native American women writers and literatures from the Northeast India. His work is published or forthcoming in The Margins, Lunch Ticket, The Lincoln Review, Chapter House Journal, The Albion Review, Glassworks Magazine, Gasher Journal, Rigorous Magazine, South 85 Journal, Sheila Nagig Online, The Roadrunner Review, and elsewhere. Yeah, so hello. Thank you so much for coming on today. And special thanks to my friends who came down just to hear me read. So, uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, my name is Abhijit, and uh, I uh, am from the northeast of India. And uh, I write about the people, the politics, the land, and uh, folklore, folk tales. Uh, of the, of the North East of India, and also I write about uh, human rights violations that had happened in the North East, and also uh, that continue to happen. So uh, I will primarily read uh, three poems today, and the first poem is called In Memoriam Sam Stafford. Sam Stafford was a 17-year-old kid who was uh, killed uh, by the police during the 2019 CAA protest in Assam. Uh, so, um, and uh, before I start reading the poems, I guess I should uh, uh, describe briefly a few terms so that the poem the poem actually makes sense to people. So uh, the, the I mean uh, Hewali is what we know in English as night blooming jasmine. Uh, there, uh, while I would read the poem, you will hear two names: Vishnu Rama and Jyoti Prasanna Garwala. They are renowned uh, cultural figures from Assam. And there's a there's a reference to 855. 855 is the reference to 855 martyrs of the Assam movement that happened from 1979 to 1985. So yeah, so uh, in memoriam, Sam Stafford has an epigraph by Aga Shahid Ali uh, that goes, "Those you will efface, I have loved." In in memoriam, Sam Stafford. The minute the bullet pierced his face, the sky so moon flooded collapsed into a rhapsody. And the, and the city swales swelled with lilac white flowers. It was a winter of untamable fire and bitter nostalgia, brother. In our turn, we funneled into history like canvassed nights through slimy skylines or dream of Havali flowers on partially August afternoons. Look, we torched all that was left of the untended dragons. We scrubbed clean the time-worn mildew turges. We raised heaven until its thoughtsums became plagues. Yet the minute the bullet pierced his face, time's desultory thrusts hurried towards its copal shadows and watched his frothy mouth snap into a pallet of meat and his body into a russet haired mannequin. Icy, stiff and frayed, overruined by fervid songs of Vishnu Ragha and Jyoti Prasad, to the bleeding pleats of the night. When the tent soil got soaked with unfathomable grief and his sharp shriek scooted through the wet barrens of amnesia, a sweltering avalanche of convulging springs crashed by a lot of clean history and landed on 85, 855 buried with headstones, a fiery bunch, but Sam walked away with slow gait through a Saladin street while those of us who stayed wintered in Wu. This poem is uh, dedicated to Sam's mother, Mama Nisimha. Uh, the next poem I will read is called Guzzle for Stateless Bodies. Uh, in, in Assam, uh, we have this uh, huge problem of uh, illegal immigration. But uh, those who are uh, doubted to be illegal immigrants, they are kept in detention centers. 
I believe no matter what, nobody should be kept in detention centers. So this poem is for them. And um, yeah, so I will mention Becky. Becky is actually a, a, a right bank tributary of the mighty Brahmaputra in Assam. And also Kavali, I'm sure a lot of you know, Kavali is a form of Sufi Islamic devotional singing. And Khagrabari is a village on the fringes of Manish National Park in Assam. Uh, this poem, Ghazal for Stateless body, uh, Bodies, has an uh, epigraph. It is by Harsh Mandar. Harsh Mandar is a, a social activist in India. So I will read uh, the epigraph so that it makes sense. I mean, a lot of you get context out of that. So the epigraph goes something like this. Indefinite incarceration of men, women, and children in conditions worse than that of convicted prisoners only because they were unable or not enabled to prove their citizenship greatly diminishes India, its government, but even more its people. So here it goes. Ghazal for State of Paris. The universe is filled with papers of our whereabouts, but which weighs home. Painted in the color of dawn and wood smoke, Pecky assures heaven, but not home. Blistered bodies left to nuts, numbered children on most nights, imagine bruised shades of badash, worn sapphires flaring through steeps covered in wet ash and home. In this watercourse of dispossessed cadavers, we are muddy currents of history, having our cries into lullabies to reverberate across thick meadows of our childhood, our home. Were it possible, we would have tracked our cut of heaven and fetched our parts for you. Maybe we dreamt it all. Silk hills turning into sparrow plumes, chiseled fathers back home. How bizarre to still have faith, to dream of departing on horseback along through death. Let the sentinels of salvation put down their guards and open the last postern to home. Let the turfs of desolate Kavalis finger the Gulmohar misted evenings of Khagrabari. How to expunge those visions of crocheted streets bustling with bulbuls opening to home. Our blood is molasses now. The sky from here, a symbol of a turquoise god, and when rain plows the earth, we can overhear the screams of our sisters hauled behind our home. Because you barely listen to choruses of shifting grasses, to whistles of the ancient land, or see the twists of golden flowers on crisp days, you know nothing about our land, our home. So the last poem uh, that I will read is called Never Heard Back. Uh, Never Heard Back is a personal poem. I, I normally don't write personal poems, uh, but last fall I tried to write one, and uh, this uh, got published in the margins a few days back, and it just fell out of the oven. So, uh, so this poem is about love, it is about loneliness, and it is about uh, how the pandemic, coronavirus pandemic changed me as a person. Uh, this, uh, this poem has an epigraph uh, by Wendy Shu. It's, why do I look so, I'm sorry, why do I turn my head so piously to the sky? Never heard back. Tomorrow, <coughs> they won't know an empty body from a ceremonial sunset. And we, who are left, on crinoline Sunday mornings, will write down recipes from our mother's oil mark magazines for luncheons our lovers never show up for. We'll enjoy the greasy taste of a city left to oniric raccoons. We'll count ice packs left on the bed in the dark. Some afternoons, I count shadows of tiny birds on my father's knees. And on others, I count people in the supermarket just to remind myself that the world is a lot lonely now, but not just to me. No one buys cheap stoneware dishes for their old mothers. They stand quietly at the counter and intone spindly summer thoughts for their kids. And the kids, othered from the loss, groove to the mock static of indifference. The supermarket is always loud, but not sad enough to drown the convulsions of our loneliness. So we hold on to our stories till our grief crests and tides like morning sunlight on river walks. Is it enough to say we can no longer look into each other's eyes without crying? Without believing, we are buffeting apart the crazed hearts of our enemies. How, can, how will one explain this nightmare to their lover for comfort? 
Perhaps every percussive song ladling out of this ungodly augury clamps an answer. Truth. The maps of absence are full of wilting shadows and the hearts nailed with human guilt. Now we can see why our mothers prayed but didn't have the courage to love. The world always finds its ways to pencil despair over our flesh. I'm not even exaggerating when I say in this empty house I can hear you whine about great food strain. Oh, sorry, I will read this line again. I'm not even exaggerating when I say in this empty house I can hear you whine about grapefruit stains on your winter coat. For you, I sing the same songs and read the same orbit. The back door opens to a clean blue evening, but please don't leave. Thank you. Maxime Berklaz is a PhD student in creative writing at the University of Georgia. He's in fact off the JV team now, this is his second year. So <laughs> uh, he writes poetry and thinks about horror. He has published poems in Burning House, Prelude and Deluge, and reviews in Pank and Tarpaulin Sky. He came to us from the University of Notre Dame, and prior to that, Switzerland. Maxime. say also before that, between Switzerland and now, there is also Ohio, which, you know, <laughs> beautiful state of Ohio, if anyone don't want to leave out the crown jewel in there. Um, okay, so I'm just going to read a couple poems. Um, uh, so there's going to go, it's going to kind of alternate between, like, uh, titled ones and then kind of shorter ones in the middle, so I'll just signal that by a pause. Um, yeah. Abba. I dreamt of a form of suicide that would let me sleep for centuries. The beheaded horse folds in upon itself, swallows its tail to its shoulders, tattered, the spiral wound, radio spores, ligaments, the shroud lines. Limbless, I came to the atavistic city whose black waters were crossed by a thousand red bridges. Claustral of the cypress hive, the echoes of the horse skull hollow the space behind the walls of the house in the eye of what is neither ground nor atmosphere, the carrion stars inscribe my organs. Anti-radial, the stigophonic vortices of the tongue. It was fish white, and in the mirror it was fish white in the mirror. On countable sections, flitter mice. Le cabaret du chamois. But why did they let him run the wax museum before and after his execution? Was it because the headsman looked so much like Mr. Shemda. Strain the honey from the celluloid through the cheesecloth. The bet was only to spend one night in the waxworks. They found each statue with its eyes removed. Morning scuttled in on policemen's boots. Le vent hurle, et l'obscurité prête aux formes immobiles des apparences redoutables et mystérieuses. Projections of fore and hind wings, each socket lined concave, death mask of the cinema firstborn, Don't keep rouge, organic effigy, black melt, twitch to dissolution. Vision curls and retracts to the edges. Look into the eyes of the wax figure. Look into the headsman's Rottweiler mouth. Monkey shines the name of the screen that is not, shuddering with the soon and lost tagmata of the visual. Gill like structures, disconnected from the spine. In the shuttered storefront of the jewelers hangs a row of fish hooks. Sack larvae wither the lamps. A figure crosses the desert of black salt. Did I see the bathic ribbons of the sky unfurl like the skull of a great bird? Did I see the bathic ribbons of the sky lash forth like oarfish? Did I see the bathic ribbons of the sky grasp me like grain in the beak? Leviathan's cod flesh spread a pair of wings. Silver gilt fowl dangle from the barbs, the bodies of ducks or swans, swimming blood and rains. Did I see the clear blue sky untroubled by waves? Mother of pearl of the slaughterhouse. The pharyngeal jaws of the walls disanchors the abandoned town among the dunes. The door to the shop opens wide. There is a sound like the sea. 
angular term, a field of small wooded limbs moving like grain. In the absence of the mandible, a small skull at the base of the hill or beneath it, delicate and thin as eggshells, it has been years since I returned to the narrow street where I was born, where the bells refuse to sound, and the only music is the organ grinder and his ape, the one he named after. Summer wind fans away the dirt, revealing the mass of cavities. He had the cranium of a man. It has been years since I wandered the corridors of the old museum, and still the marble statues wind like smoke. He had the cranium of a man with the incisors of a rodent. Hallways of memorial cavities marrow the hill, a nest of white chains, the painted ceiling cracks with age, and from the petrified altar rings the organ song, delicate and thin as eggshells. A column of hanged men arrayed across a board of hide. Their tusks carved shadows fall mickle like within the unlit room. Gelbrad, owl carcasses hung from the hedges. Knights of the wicker mask circle the enucleated stars, first westwards, then Wittershins. Oh, a cathedral of horn and sunken chambers. From the belly of the horse rose the rib vault of the orbital, dangling cenotops. A vessel of arachnoid mater crowned in iron room. The wren, the nightingale, and the thrush do not approach the roads for fear of the blazing corpse. Read like the lamp swaying in hand pipes wither shins, dog headed melody loping among the juniper trees. There, all. The still hand on the banister. The nail that grows underneath the nail, soft and fibrous, precinct in the mountain, the buccal mass of the tapestry, the flooded byway, you remember, on the night of the storm, a man swaying on reedy legs, gallops across the landscape like a great bird, the stable goes up in flames, ivy hoof of the howl, clay flows beneath the tumuli, you remember, the miniature. Staircase beneath the mountain. Murmurations of four-limbed roads form the flight membrane of dusk. Leviathan is a vast rag of black thread folded, molding the Formarian sky. Exuviae of night foam the sign of torpor. The wing sea, a temple bell. The light was tenoral in its dissolution. Echoes had molded the caves and left shells of red fruit behind. I refused to visit the site of the killings. Kutha letter number one. Dear, father voiced, I do not. This house is unending. Sunset and noontime are reduced to bare equivalency in the mouth of clay, and I am envious. I wander the room's ivy wood. Where is your memory? For something else to grow. Mother voiced, the pale tower, fruit of the spine unfolds within the antechamber. I have taken to draping a mask of gauze over my features and going by touch. Mammal voiced, given, re-given, what is the word for the inverse of a labyrinth, its underbelly of staircases and dark bristles, the sea of black hair? Pendulum voiced in mire, the absence of a courtyard, each fireplace series <coughs> of decapitations. Reptile voiced on wild length, a wing of mannequins goes up in flames. There is something that wanted the loss, the desire of wood to burn. Cigarette voice, a painting of the sun going out. I trail fishing line for my garments and Solomonic columns, a pelt of hooks. I hope this letter finds you well. <laughs> um, and I'm just going to, I think for our time, I'm just going to do kind of a long one and call it a day. Um, image of Johann Schopfer's suicide projected on smoke. Mouth and eye meet on a train. Meat is perhaps the wrong word. Mouth and meat and eye are on the same train. No one says a word. The train slides to the streets or canals of some Italian city, a stocking-wearing animal dragging its waterlogged body behind it. There is no continuity between the plazas that is not the continuity of night. Light has cast off its source, molded itself into a distant palace, a mixture of Byzantine, Gothic, Moorish, and the photographs of missing faces. Meat makes his way to the cockpit to find the butcher captain. Mouth and eye make love in the scarlet confines of the cargo bay. The floor is thick with ejaculated fluids, hydra-headed, and the algal mats and sedimentary deposits common to geothermal springs. 
outside an ocean of quicklime, rives in a manner some would describe as rage, and others would dismiss as the affectless convulsions of disfigurement. Despite the captain, the train presses on. In fact, it is because of the corpse that it does so, that it has ever done so. Funeral processions pass by, but they are mostly guesswork. Meat is flayed into a net of herrings. In the room of the train, the bricks turn against sight and touch, but fail to evade hunger. The cells inside the walls, the fissiparous mass of apartments, villas, and monasteries woven into the underside of each surface like a subterrane, assume the form of flames to escape. Mouth chases eye through decades. One empire of murder gives way to another. A bloated carcass revealing its strata, the unveiled, worn like a horned mask. Chalicerae snap and sing, hold court. The rooms in the burning swamp are pulped <coughs> into their moth-eaten fibers, rewoven with street lamps and what little moonlight is brighted on the waves. Only when the close-up realizes the socket is just a mouth in waiting does the hunt end in the loss of a whole topography. Sight remained despite the crumbling, but only as a mode of consumption. is a doctorate student in English and creative writing at the University of Georgia. She received her MFA in fiction from Cornell University. Her work has been published in Window Tangerine, Transition 119, and elsewhere. Neoma? Somewhere in my childhood, but I cannot remember. Bras Halfa, my name not Casey. His voice is a low tenor, almost conspiratorial. His perfume is not nearly strong enough. He leans close enough to me that I can fully appreciate the engulfing mist of the ecosy on his breath. He must see me once because he moves back to let me breathe. I don't respond, but pretend to go through the old messages on my Blackberry. It doesn't work. My phone, which hasn't been charged in close to a week for lack of electricity, lets out a loud warning. Casey laughs and asks, Your own name, Unko? Uche, do I say? Just Uche. I hope this is the end of our conversation. It is not. Ah ah, Bogajana's brother says, I don't know how to respond, so I just smile. He's silent for a while, so I go back to my phone. I want to text Trisha to come and rescue me but cannot decide whether the text will cost what is left of my battery life when Casey leans over and shouts over the music. So, Ochman, 
why do you want to donate your kidney? He glides on that and donates like a wink. No one I know calls me Hodgman. Something in my face makes him burst out laughing. He pours his head back like a sack of Ijebukari and just lets it out. When he comes down again, he says, Now nah, maybe your person now. We we'll talk for fun. Wait, sing. Your girlfriend tell you say no secrets. I go over my earlier conversation with Trisha the day I got the news. You need money, Uchi. This thing will give you money. She cannot. When I find my mom, all that comes out is she's not my girlfriend. He continues as if I haven't spoken. Look around. I do. All the tables close to us are empty, but for bottles of Star and Origin standing unopened or half finished around uh, on them. Everyone else is at the dance floor. It's like the radio has swallowed them up. Uh, them all, Trisha included, and left me alone with Mr. Louis Denton. When I turn back at Casey, his smile is triumphant. Now Casey built this joint, this place not my own. Everybody for this room go happily live here with one kidney tonight, he says. They could even dash me to serve if I agree. His laugh is beginning to grate on my eardrums. He continues, you know what's in Casey stand for? Kanechiku, I offer awkwardly. Again, he pretends I haven't spoken. Kidney chief. Now me be the chief supplier of policy kidneys. I did get customers for Belgium, Dubai, even Togo here. The music changes to a distinctly American sounding electro dance song uh, with the refrain, one morning in September. And someone yells that this is neither morning nor September. I beg, change it to Dorobuchi. Everyone laughs. The DJ is skinny, sweating man with a thick pair of glasses covering half his face, reluctantly obliges. These people for Europe, small team, they kill them. But our people, they even drink exhaust smoke like say nothing they have one. He brings out a square piece of paper from his back pocket. It is almost black with tiny letter notes. He writes something I can't see over a less dense part of the paper and turns back to me. How old you be? I know be football age at the top hole. He laughs again. 25, 26 next month. He nods his head and writes this down. Correct. Blood type? I don't know, I say. It is true. No problem, we go find out. You get HIV. He laughs at my expression again. I suppose make sure now, young boys like you like to, they run, uh, run like say condom about in this piece. Cancer, I shake my head no. Diabetes, hepatitis, heart and liver disease. I have never been tested for any of these, but I shake my head anyway. Occupation. I want to tell him that I have a second class upper in applied mathematics. Not from any Yaya backyard school either. From Nsuka. I want to add that I stood in for the valedictorian when he got a throat infection on the morning of convocation. That I gave an extempore speech so rousing that the husband of the assistant to the deputy governor had walked out in tears. Me to speech. I write an Okada, I say instead. For now, I add. For now? He looks vaguely interested. Wasn't well, be the other job? <clears throat> Nothing yet, I say, feeling useless. Uh -huh. So it be Okada right there now. Okada right there, full stop. No, they do smell my hair. He grunts and adds something else to his paper. He comes close to my face. I notice the tiny oil bumps on his nose, the kind that spit out yellow pus if you press hard enough with tissue. I see the ends of the hair in his nostrils. You be sickle cell, he whispers. No. And he not seem so. You don't look like sickle cell. That's not look like you look like strong man. He, sla he slaps my shoulder so hard, it feels like hot water has been poured on it. He writes again in his paper and puts it in his pocket. He's smiling at me. We say you need the money for Seth. Trisha arrives to my relief. The DJ has stuck to his American electro dance music thing, and there's a loud exodus of loud complainers pouring from the giant radio. Trisha is sweating so much, the tips of her purple braids drip water on the white plastic table. Her bright orange lipstick has escaped the limits of her small mouth so that she looks like a child that has married Nutrici all over her face. Now you be the yoga KC. Why did they question my nigga like say he be criminal? Collect the kidney, me we come out of bed. My guy don't already fast finish today. True baby, I know if he do have today. Casey smiles broadly. He knows he's a big man and he wants to make sure we know too. Uh-uh, okay. 
I know from Trisha's expression that she knows the game and doesn't mind playing along. He talks to me will come today. Well, I don't change my mind. Tomorrow on my wedding anniversary, we don't already buy two cows, big fat cows. I won't come up go house Thanksgiving for sharp, for seven sharp sharp. Oga okay, Casey, please now. I tell you say Uche now my personal person and my guy need the money badly. He sighs heavily like we are bothering him. Okay now. And then I know go say wasting he need that for. He won't pay your bride price. Trisha laughs so hard I'm not sure whether I should be offended. Me, marry Uche do. No, Uche now my brother from childhood. She pauses and glances at me and continues with an unconvincing reluctance. He won't use the money bury him papa for giving Jabe. Casey looks genuinely surprised. Sorry, sorry, you. Not so this like me. Which time your papa died? Over two years now, got Casey. Trisha continues before I even think to reply. He no one tell anybody because the money for the burial pass in no day. In fact, the much worry they don't they call him since to come collect the body. Even relatives they ask him, where, they ask when papa died since. Nobody can believe old man who go Lagos two years come forget himself. Trisha does me with an unreadable expression. Okay, okay. Now just follow you, should be your young Mr. Man, follow me, where go? He finishes his, car, his can of star with a noisy gulp and leads me across the room toward the giant radio. As the music gets louder, I feel a sudden urge to grab the orbs of the giant radio to feel the vibration of the sound under my palms. So happy am I to, fully be, to finally be able to fulfill my role as opera, a true first song. I am reaching out to touch the radio eyes when the skinny DJ gives me a look. I don't care. The neck part is rough against my palm. Like a good opera, that Uche has sent his father away very well. I can already hear people saying. Yes, yeah, so one good son is better than many rascals. Did you hear he made the second class opera at Ansuka? It has taken close to 24 months to come to this decision, but I'm certain now in a tiny nightclub in Festac, blasting American dance music from a giant radio that is the right one. With 450,000 naira, I will not only give my father the burial he deserves, I will even have some left over to pay my NEPA bill or buy a second-hand generator. Maybe even look for a new flat somewhere in Apapa or close to Keja and finally get a real job. Um, I will take my time to search for a good job, however temporary, and grab hold of my destiny with my two Gorokoro hands. I can picture my father saying, Uchendu, my son, my only child, I am so proud of you. Without his chill, trampling voice, like he did on the day of my graduation from Musuka. Um, <clears throat> I will start my flat search tomorrow, ride my Akada around town without picking any customers. Maybe even drive close to someone, ask where they are going, and just speed up before they can talk. Suddenly, I'm laughing and laughing and laughing, and I cannot stop. A few stragglers on the dance floor stare uncomprehending at me, but a woman in a Rihanna red weave smiles at me. I wink at her and she turns away, still smiling. A feeling like something warm against my calves lifts me across the dance floor and the, the bemused DJ. I would have started to break dance to the electro dance music if Casey wasn't at the end of the room now, glaring impatiently at me. Thank you. Ellen Boyette is a poet from Asheville, North Carolina. She's a graduate of the Iowa Writers' Workshop, where she was an Alberta Kelly Fellow and a Teaching Writing Fellow. Her poems appear or are forthcoming from the Action Books Focus feature, the Columbia Review, the Bennington Review, Jubilat, and elsewhere. Ellen. Effective water paling, tributaries, a place romantic earth, the trap, the stitch, the pendulum, on which I balance the force of my body, laud me for being so moved, my labels placed on words I know. Concede me this once into the qualifying water, into the misjudged lake. I drip drop, off me comes, off me comes repeating. Feathers, but just the word feathers. To roll into a pinafore, to pin up on a drawing line. Off me comes, slighted steam, 
a tutorial for overload, a manufactured lifetime supply of care. Fresh air, rewind the need for slow movement, weighted improved ripple in the disappearing divert. I am coursing across a hydrogen meadow in a down blanket, asking, is this normal? Rewind divination song symmetry. Is this formally prescient? When can I stop? Drip drop down the word weather, rain and singular. We'll hear, heal the mare, dehydrate hay, and me the riding crop. Me the defective. Come sit in the birthing pool. Lift from it what you will. Conveniently staggered and approaching a quota of hard beads, the place romantic. Earth is mostly blue, and I too pull shards from my green belly, sublime to be so moved by a glossed finger lingering. This next one is called Aversion. Intricate acceleration <coughs> is the forefront of my nervous breakdown. Pounds come from my vessel, and I let them slaughter the furniture of my torso, pretend to make dinner for a family of four. On a Venn diagram of boredom, a version of saying, let me in, please stay a minute longer, lies dead center. Of the summit's uncharitable baldness, forgetting how to sink when this is supposedly a winter of doing better, I contest. Letterhead permits us saying no to withdrawal, and this time, there is no prehensile fee to sculpt my prudish statue lacking. The app of brain sounds that beckon me into dreams of hidden pills, a version of silence lubricating teeth whitener in my own house, no less. Here's my take on nauseated splintering, an affect. I place on walls that remarkably listen to my murmured incantation, and take on a voice of unliftable boxes just to sit slumped over on a bed, a chair. I feel for those who toil religiously. I feel for those who carry eggs in a brace. Everything is so tempestuous to me out of commission. Someday I'll be like them, a version of smiling for fake endorphins and the carry-on will be triumphant, but right now I can't douse it in gasoline and flick the match. And in that aversion to truth, I'll be the type of freedom that volunteers outside a refrain, an aberrant ornament that holds up its own branch. Catch me falling on men I just met who hand me candy to bring back consciousness. It's Epicurean, you know. It's the smallest dose of strangers who love you. I'm out like a light at 3 p.m., and still there are words for trains that feel like they're moving. All right, this is my last poem. It's called I His Here in the Fade. Towards me in weather slink elastic and minted lizards, tit mice, rat snakes, who leave their glyphs upon the visited dead. Eyes go back in heads, and towards varicose bedlam the heads go, toward, toward a closer communing. Told not to utter afraid, honest close shutters as seizures. To reap if I am petticoats from metaphor, with great sobriety, I veil my face. Pinnacle the vivisected, falling the graded heretic, and toward her stone two sprigs converge a handle, so June has pockets, a place to grasp the lack, and I welcome that togetherness. Always goodbye, the slug is its slime, the soap its rind of scum. In my raincoat, I am not a minuscule world, flung gently off me, protected. I want to hold a broken babe, the slack of my turning. Thank you.